This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric reporting tonight from Cairo. Good evening, everyone. It may be after midnight, but as you can see behind me, hundreds of diehard protesters are still milling around Liberation Square. It's been a bloody day here in Cairo. According to the Egyptian Health Ministry, as of now, at least three people have been killed, more than 600 injured in today's violence. All of Egypt is holding its breath, wondering what will happen next. It rapidly became clear President Mubarak's words had only inflamed the street. His supporters flooded the square. Some rode in on horses and camels, brandishing weapons and hurling rocks. They are being blocked. Ibrahim Kamel, General Secretariat of Mubarak's administration, praised the new wave of protesters and dismissed the demonstrators demanding change. I'm sorry to say that these few people that are standing in the square are not Egypt or the Egyptians. Who are they? They are part of a minority that is intent on dealing with Egypt and the regime, a blow that I hope will never happen. As we spoke, thanks that we have, thanks. Gunshots rang out from the square below. Given what we're seeing behind us at this moment, do you truly believe there can be a peaceful transition of power while President Mubarak is still in office? 100% there will be a peaceful transition of power and I am sure that what you're witnessing today will be something of the past, hopefully sooner than many people think. But by nightfall, it had only escalated. Molotov cocktails replaced the sticks and stones of the afternoon clashes. A message on Twitter spoke volumes. Oh my God, oh my God, we are in Tahrir Square. They are killing us. The thugs have killed us. It's, it's absolutely appalling what is happening down there. And the no stranger to conflict, Marie Colvin of the Sunday Times lost her eye covering the Sri Lankan civil war. She was in the thick of things as pro-Mubarak supporters converged. They came with um, pieces of machinery, they came with rocks, they came with knives, and they came to try to clear Tahrir Square of the anti-government supporters who have started fighting back but were bloodied in the beginning. They're now chopping up the pavement to throw rocks back. It's mayhem down there. Did the Mubarak government orchestrate this? This has been organized on some level by the Mubarak government. We don't know what level, but the people that we are seeing attacking Tahrir Square now are Mubarak supporters. They were bussed in. Some of them were paid. Quite a few are government employees. That simply does not happen in Egypt without official sanction. Meanwhile, it was unclear what role, if any, the Egyptian military was playing. They're sitting in their tanks. They're intervening on neither side. Uh, the protesters felt the military was there to protect them. They're not doing anything tonight. Today, the White House strongly denounced the fighting. If uh, any of the violence is instigated by the government, uh, it should stop immediately. Shock waves of unrest continued to ripple throughout the Middle East today as the president of Yemen announced he would not seek re-election after his term expires in 2013. Here in Egypt, part of the government's call for a return to normalcy included restoring internet access. But there is no sign the protesters will back down until Mubarak leaves office. They declared Friday the day of departure the day they want him gone. Mubarak has offered no evidence he will agree to that demand. How do you see this shaking out? I mean, this seems like the beginning of a civil war. It's going to get worse. Everyone is saying, and I believe it will happen, Friday will be a, a really decisive day and very violent day. Richard Haas is president of the Council on Foreign Relations. Richard, a member of parliament, went on Al Jazeera today and admitted business associates close to the regime did in fact pay some of these pro-Mubarak protesters to hit the streets. Does that surprise you? 
No. The, the purpose of this may have been to intimidate the people in the streets, may have been to create a real sense of crisis, to force the army's hand. Throughout much, much of Mr. Mubarak's 30 years of rule, he tried to portray himself as the person who stood between Egypt and chaos or between Egypt and an Islamic alternative. So the sort of violence we've seen today, while some of it may have been spontaneous, the idea that some of it may have been orchestrated by the president and his supporters should not come as any surprise. Can Hosni Mubarak survive until the September elections or will something have to give given this violence today? I don't believe he can survive until the, the elections. I think the situation would continue to get worse. Uh, and I think the, the army will not let it get that far and the army will step in. Hosni Mubarak also has to be careful here. Uh, the potential for mob rule, the potential for uh, things to deteriorate so the crowds turn on him personally is, is considerable. I actually feel that people are playing with fire. Egypt today started to move exactly in the direction none of us wanted to see. When do you think the army will step up? A few more days like today where the situation begins to spiral out of control and the army essentially either continues to look feckless and weak in the face of the crowds or is forced to use violent uh, means against the demonstrators, I don't believe that's an acceptable choice for this army. So I think sooner rather than later, this phase of things needs to come to an end. And I truly hope that the U.S. government is privately communicating this, this message to the leadership of the army and to the vice president. Richard Haas. Richard, thank you so much. As we reported, when violence erupted today, the military did not try to stop it. As Elizabeth Palmer reports, so far the military has not taken sides. But the question is, will they? After brutal riot police melted away last Friday and the army rolled in, they were embraced as protectors come to restore public order. In fact, that's been their main role for almost 40 years. It was the military that handed out bread to calm food riots in 2008. It's very good. With 468,000 soldiers on active duty, Egypt's military is the largest in the Arab world. It gets about a third of its money, $1.3 billion in 2010, from the United States. But it hasn't actually been in combat since 1973 in the war against Israel. Back then, the dashing Air Force commander, Hosni Mubarak, was hailed as a hero. And in 1981, he became president. The military then amassed huge power and wealth. In a leaked cable, U.S. Ambassador Margaret Scobie described the military as a quasi-commercial enterprise itself, which owns vast tracts of prime real estate and has major interests in, among other things, hotels, construction, and weapons manufacturing. It's estimated to control at least a third of Egypt's $200 billion economy. It controls much of the state, too. All three top cabinet officials appointed by President Mubarak a few days ago are senior military commanders. So far, the soldiers have stayed neutral in this crisis. All day today, their top commanders were receiving calls from the Pentagon urging restraint. But they still hold the balance of power. And the question is, if Mubarak orders them to put down this uprising, will they obey? Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News. Cairo. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton told Egypt's new vice president that the transition needs to begin now. He's offered to hold talks with opposition leaders, but today many of those leaders said they will not come to the table until Mubarak is gone. The backdrop of violence in Cairo today only underscores the long road ahead for Egypt. But he doesn't seem to get it. You know. Mohammed El Baradai, former head of the International Atomic Energy Agency and one of the lead negotiators for the opposition, says working with Mubarak is non-negotiable. I will never get into a dialogue while Mubarak is in power because all what you do is you, you know, give, give that regime a legitimacy, which I, in my view, they have lost. But more importantly, I don't think he understands what democracy means. I don't think he understands that he really needs to let go. El Baradai says there would be no power vacuum if Mubarak were to leave immediately and believes stoking fears about what a new Egypt might look like is a ploy by the current government. The hype that 
once Egypt become a democracy, will become hostile to the U.S. and hostile to Israel. I mean, these are these are the two hypes and or frictions. If they enter here, but Ibrahim Kamel, a close confidant of Mubarak's, says he is concerned about an extremist power grab and insists the majority of Egyptians support the president and want to give him time. Ninety percent of Egyptians will tell you that. President Mubarak represents for Egypt something very valuable. They stand behind him. They believe that by the end of his term, the changes that will take place in our political system will make Egypt a much better place for the future. Whatever lies ahead for Egypt, Amr Musa, the head of the Arab League, which represents 22 Arab nations, says there is no turning back for Egypt or the rest of the Arab world. The message has been sent, the message has been received. It will never be the same again. I firmly believe that the Arab world in one year time will not be the same as we see it today.